We've been in this series of messages um, for the summer, and um, we're looking at uh, harbor values. What are the kind of the key essential things uh, in, in ministry and in our lives and in our relationships that, um, that will define who we are and how we are and, and what happens uh, as, as God uses us in this world? And so we started out looking at the... Uh, this is a place for the adventurous spirit, and, uh, and that we're not going to be on a, you know, a glass-bottom bus in North Dakota. That's not what the Christian life's like. That's not what church is going to be. We're just looking down at the road and missing everything, but we're going to be on an adventure. And then last week, Jana led us and pointed out the, the absolute uh, call to pass on our faith to, to next generations and to invest in in, uh, in kids, and, uh, and that's not really about us. So I thought, well, that's really everything, so there's nothing more to do this summer. Um, and then uh, dawned on me that, no, there may be some other values. So um, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. It's um, towards the back of the Bible. It's a very short um, letter, so it's easy to miss it as you turn the pages. But... Um, that's okay, because I'm going to read it to you. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. So uh, Paul writes this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to one hope, and you were called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors or teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So Lord, teach us from this. Teach us what's important. Teach us what is essential. Teach us how we might live differently because this is true. That, that's our prayer today. Amen. Um, I love that passage because it, to me it, it's sort of the um, focus in on the essence of what it means for us to be a Christian community, followers of Jesus, or what it means for us to be a church. And um, I got to tell you, um, maybe because, you know, I'm ADD or something, it's easy for me to get distracted or to, to miss the points in, in things. And it's easy for me to think I, I understand something in Scripture and, and know how to apply it, and then I get it wrong just a little bit, you know, not much, just a little bit. But then that little bit actually changes everything. You ever have that happen? So um, I, I may have shared this with you. I, I never remember what I've shared with you. So um, I should probably write it down someday. But um, I lifetime Presbyterian pastor here. You know, I think over the 32, 34 years I was a Presbyterian pastor. Now honorably retired so I can do real ministry. And um, <laughs> oh, that was really bad. So um, anyway. I cut this out of a Presbyterian uh, publication that they sent to us uh, a few years ago. Presbyterian, anybody ever known a Presbyterian? 
Okay, okay. I'm not, you know, I'm just <laughs> picking on y'all. But um, so the thing is, we prided ourselves in our orderliness. In fact, our motto was we do everything decently and in order, which means we do nothing, really. But um, so we have a uh, uh, constitution of the Presbyterian Church, the rule that, and, and, and they study these and work on these, and every word is perfect, and then, you know, it's really difficult to bring about changes. So a few years ago, I got the memo from Louisville, where the headquarters is, the national headquarters for the church, the Office of the General Assembly, and they had to make a correction in the constitution of the church because there was evidently a mistake made. And that's hard to believe in a, in a domination of a church. I'm sorry, I'm mocking you. Okay. <laughs> so the mistaken sentence in the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA said, the church must be an exclusive condemning community. <laughs> now this was sent out to millions of people in every church in America and to the press and the media and to international relationships. Uh, the church must be an exclusive condemning community. <laughs> now I gotta tell you, it I don't really do we have to be okay? You know, I understand they vote on stuff and then we have to go on. So the memo from the headquarters is the word not is missing. <laughs> the sentence should have read the church must not be an exclusive condemning community, it must be a community of welcome and love. Well, that's different. <laughs> that is so different. I'm glad they caught it. Imagine the impact we would have had in our ministries if we would have followed our constitution. <laughs> but, you know, I think about that. It's a little thing can make such a, a difference in, in how we live out our faith and how we are together as a church and how we follow Jesus because we think, well, we got most of it right. You know? How bad could it be if we just miss a little bit? Well... I want to talk today about what our strategy is as a church. Um, we've been in existence not very long. You know, we're a little church plant. We started in a home uh, in Woodway, and then we went to the pizza parlor in Edmonds. This is all part of our legend. And uh, um, had pizza after church every Sunday. That was living. And uh, <laughs> we lost that, yeah. And then, and then uh, this church... Uh, closed up and they called and offered and they said we hear you're in a pizza parlor you want a church building and we went I don't know <laughs> we're looking for one and so here we are it's been three years now and so you know God's blessed us and has brought in uh, new folk and different folk and and we we're a different church than we were even a year ago aren't we completely different church and and I guess next month we'll probably be completely different than we are now as, as we grow together so I thought it's probably important for us to look and see there, there is, um, in Scripture, there's biblical theology. How, what we believe about God and, and about ourselves and about our world and, and, what, and life and church and uh, all these things going on. And, and it is possible for good-hearted Christians who, are, who have nothing in common to agree on their biblical theology. The differences come out with having a biblical strategy. How do we live out the implications of what we believe? And that's where things can get a little hinky, you know. And so, um, as they say on Law and Order, um, the thing is, I, um, I spent a lot of my life as a pastor developing ministries that were actually pretty cool. I'm looking at the camera right now, not you all. They were pretty cool. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, lots of people and um, over, over University Press for those years, you know, we developed so many ministries that this, it was like we had the golden touch, you know. And, uh, and I've now come to realize that I was completely wrong in doing that. Isn't that weird? that I was, I, I missed the biblical strategy. 
And um, I want to read from you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, John Westfall. <laughs> uh, is Building Strong People, How to Lead Effectively. And, and I've shared from some of this with you before, but I, I want to read this to you. Because he is the person with such insight when it comes to these things. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. There is a great deal of confusion among church leaders about their roles. There's often a belief that they're expected to be managers, to be efficient, effective, and resourceful in managing God's resources as administered by the local church. Certainly, there's a need for management some of the time. But all too often, we step in and try to help God do it better. I spent my life trying to help God do it better. I'm sorry, I'm just a little confessional today. Never realizing or knowing the damage we can cause in the lives of others. We have taken care of people and done it for them so long that we've created congregations of people who are passive, dependent, uninspired, inhibited, and uncreative. That's the product that our typical ministry has done. And I'm, I'm a minister, I'm telling him that I'm guilty of this too. We've created congregations of passive people. There's a need to re rediscover an enabling style of leadership and its approach to ministry so that people can be released to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. Is it my job to build a strong ministry, or is it to build strong people who minister? That really is the question. I believe that if we build strong people who minister, then our ministries will be strong. But if we strive to build strong ministries, we may end up not building strong people at all. Boy, he knew what he was talking about. So, as a church, I look at Harvard Church, you know, we're, we're young, we're baby church, you know, we're making this up as we go along, that's our motto, and, um, and we're always open to change, and, and it suddenly hit me this week, because I was, I was praying about this and, and looking forward to exploring this with you, it suddenly hit me that if we make a small mistake at this point, it will have huge ramifications for the rest of our life together. It will, it will affect how we go forward as a church. Are we going to be, are we going to build a strong church here with strong ministries? Or are we going to say, no more strong ministries. We're going to pray and seek that the Lord would help us build people who are strong who minister. And then let the programs take care of themselves. What's it going to be? Um, I believe that we're going to do the building strong people thing. So, okay, so let me say that right up front, as in case you're wondering if I'm still trying to decide. You know, um, actually, I actually believe that. But when when it comes right down to it, when it comes right down to it, and we have to make a decision about something. I often don't live out what I believe. For example, did anybody get that email uh, this week inviting you to the brunch uh, today uh, after church? The fabulous brunch with the pancakes and eggs and all those kind of things and, and uh, all those things. It was great. And um, I hope you're ready. I hope you're hungry. Big feast downstairs in the fellowship hall and everything. Ready to go. This big brunch. So yesterday I'm, I'm in the office uh, working on the sermon and praying a little bit and uh, Jeremy walks in, our minister of worship, and uh, he said, well, I'm here um, making sure everything's ready for the brunch tomorrow. And I said, great, great. How's it going with your team? Well, not a single person in the church has offered to help. <laughs> but I think we can pull it together with our intern and with you, John, and I think maybe that we could do this, we could make this thing happen, so, because you already sent out the announcement. You know, and you know, in a church life, if the announcement goes out, that's it. Whoa, that's done. So, we sat there and looked at each other, uh, and uh, 
And then um, I went, what if we just didn't have it? Obviously, we've designed a ministry. We've designed a program here. We've designed this special event that meets absolutely no needs. Woo! -hoo! <laughs> we've got something that nobody needs or wants. But boy, what a great idea that was. You know, right? And he looked at me and went, can we do that? <laughs> I went, I don't know. Let's do it. So I said, I, was doing, I said, text me at five. If anybody, if you have no team by five, text me and, uh, and we'll just go on with our lives. And, and I thought, God did that. So I'd have a story to tell today. <laughs> you know, that's the only reason we would be having this great brunch down there. And, and eating blueberry pancakes and everything, except God said, no, John, you need a story about do you throw everything in to make the program work or do you let go of the program because it's irrelevant? The ministries are only, and this is important, okay, so write this down. The ministries are only meaningful if we see them as a, as a place for God's people to gather and connect. They have no meaning in themselves. Um, now I'm going to get in trouble with some of you, so I'm warning you, okay? So it's all right. Um, I really believe, like, when we gather in worship, we happen to have a way we do it, right? We have our way, and other churches have different ways, you know, of worshiping. I absolutely believe that what we do in worship is completely irrelevant. Now, I could just hear Eileen at home saying, you should have explained that. So, so do it. So do it. <laughs> what is worship but God calling people together to do nothing more than waste time with him? To come with no agenda, with no checklist of what needs to happen, with no uh, idea of and expectations of what what God's going to do or what we're going to do or anything like that, and and no, and no sense of uh, uh, critiquing whatever does happen, and and no about. But we just come and we say, Lord, we're just here because we haven't made much room for you in our lives, and so today for this time with these people, I'm going to set everything aside. I'm going to clear the decks and be open to you. That's worship. How often do I come in with a list of stuff? Now, no, I've got to talk to this person, and I've got to talk to them, Lord, I hope you work in that. And, you know, and if the prayer time comes up, I want to get that. And, and in the message, we've got to make sure that, you know, I hope so-and-so's there because they need to hear this. You know, I, I, I. you know, when that happens, it's not worship. It's, Lord, we're here. We've come at your invitation doesn't matter what happens or doesn't happen. It, it absolutely doesn't matter because we're here to have this time for you to do your incredible work in us. Have your way in us. So here we are. Do you know how that changes worship when we come in that way? Wow, I can't wait to find out what, why God brought me here today. It changes everything. And we don't have to bitch and moan about, oh, I didn't like that sermon, you know. The other one the other week was better, you know. You don't have to do any of that. You just erase that. So, if our strategy is going to be no more strong ministries, we're going to focus on building people who are strong. What would that look like? Well, in this passage in Ephesians 4, um, Paul reminds us of the, the unity that we have. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of us all. We, we have so much in common. But then he goes on to say that we've been given this grace. Uh, the word grace, charis in the Greek, is what we use for gifts, spiritual gifts. It's where we get the phrase charismatic comes out of that, gifted. Um, so God gives us each a grace, a gift, for what? So we can say, cool, I'm gifted. 
Hmm? No, that wasn't a rhetorical question. Actually, is that why we get the gift? No. Thank you for that. That's the answer. <laughs> so, no. We're gifted so that we can participate as, as the Holy Spirit empowers us and directs us and leads us, that we actually do the building up and the strengthening of the body of Christ. Now, I had this wrong, theologically, most of my life. I didn't understand this Ephesians 4 passage, so let me just tell you about that. I, I thought that, in fact, I used to do leadership seminars to pastors. This is how stupid I was. I did leadership seminars to pastors. That's a big mistake, because I would teach them that the pastors and every minister in the church needs to stop, stop doing stuff. Stop motivating people. Stop inspiring people. Stop getting people together to do stuff. <laughs> that was real effective. And, uh, and, and instead, I said, just let the Holy Spirit do it. Let the Holy Spirit do it. Just, just sit there passively, you know, floating in the pool with an iced tea and let the Holy Spirit do the work. I said, Isn't that, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like, well, yeah, that could work. I've heard that preached from John probably years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and then I saw something really for the first time here in Ephesians 4. Talking about Christ, who was the head. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up. I never saw that. I thought, I'm just waiting for Jesus to build the church up. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the gifts. I'm going to give you, the Holy Spirit's going to empower you. You're going to have all these things. You're going to have a new life. You're going to be loved. And then you can build each other up. Each one working together builds itself up. So how could we, after hundreds and hundreds of years of doing church, of following Jesus, of coming to worship, of hanging out, doing things together, how could we create congregation after congregation in this city? I'm, I'm not talking about other cities, just Seattle, you know, not even Bellevue. Just, <laughs> just Seattle, really. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches filled with passive people. How can that be? How can we come to worship and be passive? How can we say, oh, I support this ministry, this is really great. You know, I cheer them on as they go and do that. I think it's because, uh, in our case, I think it's because I as a pastor failed you. I have not been the pastor you needed. I've come to realize that. Um, maybe the way I approach things encourages passivity. Is that weird? I'm getting the exact opposite response from what I believe because I got it wrong. So I thought, okay, what does it mean to build people who are strong ministers? That's really going to be what we're about. That's going to be our focus. What, is it, what does it look like? Well. What would people or strong ministers be? Uh, they'd be active, <laughs> right? You got your passive thing, you got your watching thing, your critiquing thing, and then you've got your active, we're involved in it, we don't have time to critique it because we're too involved in it. You know, it would be active, right? I'm not, I'm not making that up. Uh, an, another one is that um, I, I think that, that, that people who are, are strong uh, in doing ministry are <coughs> independent. Um, we've had centuries of church building codependence in people. And maybe we need to build co-independence. Is, is that a word? Can we do that? Be co-independent? <laughs> so we're still together, but, but God's doing something to us. And, and when we're independent, you're, you're free to, to dream about ideas for ministry and things that, that may or may not work, it doesn't matter, uh, that people you can get involved with that may or may not respond, doesn't matter, uh, come up with something new. If that doesn't work, we'll do something new. 
Now, some of you, I, I just want to affirm you, you are really independent. You know, I know you, and, and, I, and bless you for your independence. You'll have to look at some of the other characteristics, but, you know, I value that. This is not a church where you're going to come in and we're going to try and make you all alike. Because, A, we're not that gifted, and B, why, why would we want to? This is, the, this is one of the most unique gatherings of people with backgrounds that that shock and amaze. <laughs> you know, every time I start to hear one of your stories, I go, wow, huh? And, and that's the way it is, right? I mean, that's the truth. And, uh, and so there's this ready to just take on the work of ministry. Another part of being a strong uh, person, being uh, the doing ministry, is, is that we're enthusiastic. I absolutely hate Wait, you're not supposed to hate, are you? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, but I still do. Okay, I absolutely hate people who want to get involved in ministry and help maybe around the church or they want to help somebody in need out of duty or out of guilt. That's the worst. Well, somebody ought to do something here, Pastor, so I guess I'll do it. Why? It'd be better to have no one doing nothing than to have you doing this out of duty and guilt. Or can you imagine somebody comes alongside you and says, hey, I'd really like to help you. You know, you, I can see you've got some needs in your life. I think I could really help. You know, I don't really want to, but, you know, I got to do it because I'm a Christian. <laughs> Boy, that's inspiring. <laughs> oh, come on over and help. <laughs> no. I mean... My, my old boss, who, who uh, I love dearly, you all know, uh, Bruce Larson, he used to say, if it's not fun, stop doing it. And I, and I called him up one day and I said, this, this being a pastor is not that much fun. <laughs> he said, well, you keep on doing it, you know, because you've got attitude. But, but everybody else can stop because it's not fun. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, he was actually right about that. If we're not exhilarated and feeling like we're the luckiest people on earth to be involved in this, why bother? Let somebody else get the joy, and we can and we can hang in with our, ministry, our misery. Uh, another part of being a strong a person to a ministry, um, is it, uh, they're courageous. It takes a lot of courage sometimes to show up. I mean, sometimes I've, I've greeted some people coming in the door here, and, and as I give them a hug at the door, I say. Wow, that must have taken a lot of courage for you to come today. And you know what they always say? It did. <laughs> it did. I had to just really kind of crank it up and, okay, I'll, I'll go in and go to church. Or, you know, I mean, you'd be sitting in the car out there or out there in the parking lot and go, I don't know if I could go in today. It takes courage. It takes courage to come in and Ask God to meet you with no strings. It takes courage to come and sit with people that are not like you or they're too much like you and not know how it's going to turn out. It takes courage to, to come alongside somebody and help. It takes courage to get involved in ministry. It takes amazing amounts of courage because we have so many things going on in our life that give us good excuses for not doing that. And we have to have the courage to say, I'm going to live beyond myself because the Holy Spirit has called me and I'm gifted and I'm following Jesus and I'm going to take a risk. The last thing it takes, I think, maybe there's probably more, but in my little list, if we're going to build people who are strong, do ministry, I think we need to encourage and cultivate understanding. Understanding. Um, not just making sure we're clear what we communicate to people, but that we actually understand that people have uh, a life and they've had a history and they have a future and 
they're not us and they're not going to respond the same way we do and and we can understand that and we can understand that sometimes people are at a place where they're not able to respond the way we think they should right and we can understand it and we can have the understanding that says you know i'm I'm going to take a risk and be vulnerable and share and encourage because we know that that is going to help them understand. And understanding is built up as we take the risk of being vulnerable and being real. I love that, you know, as we go along here, that pretty soon the, you know, I know people gossip about churches and stuff, and, and I know they'll be gossiping about us. And if they're not already, you know, why that church on the corner there, you know, yeah, right behind Dick's Burgers, you know, why we're always defined as being related to Dick's Burgers. But um, I hope that the gossip is, those people drive me crazy. They're so real. They're not phony. Those people, they just share stuff. Even if they're afraid to, they do it. Well, wouldn't that be great gossip? I've never been to a church where, where, where people seem to love each other so much, even though they're obviously troubled. <laughs> they even love their pastor. Look how troubled he is. Wow, there must be a miracle in that church. Wouldn't that be great gossip? Think about that. But see, as, as these characteristics become developed in us, we don't have to be passive. We don't have to be codependent and we don't have to be observers of what God might or might not be doing and we certainly are not evaluators with our little checklist well I'll give that an 8.2 you know uh, style points uh, we don't have to do that because we're all in this together now one of my biggest mistakes as a pastor happened um, <laughs> actually I don't remember this like that uh, first church I was in out of seminary 1977 77, wow, yeah. So I was in this uh, big church on the beach in San Diego, Solana Beach, right next to Del Mar Racetrack. Cool neighborhood. And uh, Phil Mickelson lived down the street as a child. Then. But, um, so I was in this church, and it was a big Presbyterian church, and I, I had a robe, you know, my first robe. It was brown because I liked earth tones, you know. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I got up to do the scripture reading in the morning before I preached and had an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage like we always did in the Presbyterian Church. And so I, I got the first one and did the uh, Old Testament passage. I read it and I said, now turn your Bibles to the New Testament passage. And I couldn't find it. <laughs> it was like, I'm up in front of the congregation in, a, in the big pulpit. You know, you got one of those. Looks like the, the bow of a ship. You know? and, uh, and I'm up there and it's like, Never let them see a sweat. They were seeing me sweat. I was like, <laughs> it was like someone took the entire Gospel of Luke out of my Bible. <laughs> it was gone. And I'm flipping and flipping, and, I, and I'm thinking, I can't go to the table of contents. That's so lame to do that. <laughs> and I'm not going there. So finally, in exasperation, and people are wondering, what's wrong with our new pastor, fresh out of seminary? You know, must know everything. Doesn't even know how to find the Gospels in the Bible. So I said, hey, I told you where the first one was. Somebody give me a page number. We're all in this together. <laughs> and someone shouted out, 1142. Thank you. And, you know, go on. And I didn't think anything of it. I, well, you know, that, welcome to ministry. I arrived at my office upstairs after the service, and there was a, uh, a general, retired general, standing outside my door, face so red, steam coming off his face. And I thought, boy, this guy's having some problems. Maybe, you know, drinking a little or something. I could help him. I could encourage him. So I invited him into my office. and. He would not sit down, and he just ripped me. I come to worship the sovereign God with the people of God, and I sit there, and you say, we're all in this together? And I'm like, I thought we were. <laughs> I'm sorry, man, I thought we were. 
It was like the worst thing. And, and for the rest of the time that I was a pastor of that church, he hated my guts. Hated everything about it. And, and um, because I said we're in this together. So I'd just like to go on record here. We are in this together. I don't care if you're a general or not, okay? We are in this together. He was wrong, okay? Just want to say that. For the record, okay. I did have one moment of grace with him, and that was uh, at the very end of my ministry there. He knocked on my door again, came in, and said, my father, the colonel, um, came to church with me Sunday. And after church, he said, that young man preached the gospel. <laughs> and he said, so maybe I got it wrong. So I'm sorry. But we're in this together. That's the point. For better or worse. And sometimes programs will go and sometimes they won't. Uh, if you stayed home and didn't, you didn't have any breakfast this morning because you knew the brunch was going to be so great, you know, <laughs> we don't even have donuts for you. <laughs> That's sorry. It was a wicked laugh. But, um, uh, we're going to build strong people who minister. And all the programs can come and go. They're irrelevant. We're going to build you and me together. We're going to build ourselves up. As Christ is the head, the Holy Spirit empowers and gifts us. And we do the work of ministry together. So that's the, that's the value today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you that we are all in this together. And thank you that you lead us forward. And thank you that you empower us with gifts. And you call us to serve. And you call us to serve with people who may not be like us. It's okay. And Lord, we thank you that we can come into your presence and waste time with you. Let you have your way in our life, in our heart. Now, Lord, give us the courage to be builders of people. And give us the courage to not be just builders of programs. And we'll give you the glory. Amen.